This is the continuation of the American Psychological Association Master Lecture Series on Cognitive Psychology. Code 3, Tape A-93-80. The topic is Cognitive Psychology, What's Inside. The speaker is B.F. Skinner. Thank you. I'm assisted by the fact who has accomplished the rare in the sense of writing several series of his own autobiographies. And uh, it's not often that you have the opportunity to say to, some, to an audience, uh, I don't need to tell you too much because you uh, can go right out to the closest bookstore and buy his autobiographies. It would be a lot of fun, though, to talk about Professor Skinner extensively because uh, in the uh, years that I've been in, in the field of psychology, I've always regarded him as uh, sort of the shining star. Uh, he's guided me in my own professional development over many years, and uh, I'm so thrilled and delighted to be able to introduce him. What I will do uh, is keep my remarks about him very brief because I know you're here to listen to him. Uh, Professor Skinner did his graduate work at Harvard, where he spent five postdoctoral years. In 1936, he went to the University of Minnesota, and in 1945, to Indiana University as chairman of the Department of Psychology. He returned to Harvard University in 1948, where, with Charles Furster and other collaborators, he continued his research on operant behavior. Science and Human Behavior was written for an introductory course, which was eventually taught by machine. Uh, it was that particular textbook that got me very, very involved in the area of uh, the application of operant procedures to education. Among his better known books are Walden II, Verbal Behavior, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, and About Behaviorism. And if we were to list his other writings and books, we'd be here still tomorrow morning. The two volumes of an autobiography have been published, and he is at work on a third volume. So it was, it was with uh, great pride that I'd like to introduce to you Professor B.F. Skinner. Thank you very much. I've been sung in nightclubs very much, and I probably won't keep this in the right place, but if you can't hear me, please make yourself heard. The Greeks probably started it all. At least it was with the Greeks that people first began saying quite explicitly that human behavior is caused by things going on inside the behaving person. The Greeks had a great list of these things. If a warrior fought valiantly, it was because a god had given him a large supply of menos. If he got into trouble, it was because another god had given him a large supply of ate, or reckless abandon. They didn't try to find out exactly what organs inside were involved in this. They had very little knowledge of anatomy. You could see something about the anatomy of an animal in the slaughterhouse and on the sacrificial altar, and you could see a little bit about the anatomy of, of a person, a man, on the battlefield, but that could hardly suffice. But it didn't much matter to the Greeks. They did not, the early Greek, the Homeric Greek, made no distinction between what we came to call mental and physical. That was Plato who was said to have discovered the mind. I would say in, rather that he invented it. But the earlier Greeks used a single word to cover a great variety of these internal things. For example, the word thumos, meant for the Greek, the Homeric Greek, that word was used, uh, we would now have to translate it as soul, mind, life, thought, joy, sorrow, desire, courage, temper, and also breath or breathing, and the heart. Well, that if you just wanted to refer to something going on inside that would, was responsible for behavior, you just said thumos. Another word, phren or phrenes, uh, referred to such things as the heart and the lungs, the diaphragm, but also purpose, the senses, willpower, and so on. In other words, they just had this tendency to cook up something inside that explained the behavior and let it go at that. And it was Plato that caused all the trouble by running out of organs for these things and deciding that many of them had no organs and were therefore mental or of some metaphysical nature. 
we still do this. For example, we have no hesitation in reporting that a friend of ours has a job but his heart is not in it, or that he doesn't have the guts to resign. We talk about nerves being on edge, political figures lacking the brains needed to govern properly, and so on. In other words, we, like the Greeks, still talk about things inside, and we're, we're quite uh, open and uh, referring to organs in a very casual way. The humor is all down through the Middle Ages. The humor is where supposed to be responsible for personality traits. Uh, you could see the humors, uh, blood, phlegm, bile, and so on, and each one of them had its uh, personality trait, so that you said a person was sanguine if he had lots of blood, and phlegmatic if there's too much phlegm, and, and that sort of thing. And the cognitive psychologists today uh, flip-flop back and forth between the brain and the mind. You find it in the same sentence, perhaps. So it starts out to be a statement about the mind, turns out to be something about the brain. Now, what, was, what is wrong with this is that not, it's not the mind-matter distinction. I couldn't care less about that. The main thing is this tendency to look inside the individual for an explanation, whether it is mind or matter, doesn't, doesn't really matter. The whole question is whether you are looking in the right place for the right thing. And as a matter of fact, we vastly overestimate our knowledge of what is inside. An article in the American Psychologist not so long ago I said that behaviorism must accommodate itself to accepting the importance of what goes on inside the black box, especially since we now have methods for investigating its contents. Well, what methods? Certainly, what is in the black box is an organism with all its organs and cells and so on, and molecules and DNA and RNA and all of that. Physiology, of course, is the field in which that is analyzed, but physiology completely lacks the micro techniques needed to reach those extremely small, subtle structures which are involved when a person behaves. We can talk about different sides of the brain, the effects of gross lesions, the effects of, of the drugs found in the brain, and so on. But before we have the kind of physiology that will enable us to predict the slightest move, such as saying hello, we would have to have techniques of extraordinary delicacy, uh, something would, that would make the computer chip look rather gross. We'd have to be something very, very fine, delicate, reaching not to just one point, but to the functioning system of, of nerves which uh, would be necessarily involved in that kind of thing. It's not fair to pick on popularizations of physiology, but a recent television program explained to its viewers what happens in visual perception. The film showed the usual cross-section of the eye with the image upside down on the retina, and then lots of little flashes going up the optic track back to the cortex in the back of the brain, where, lo and behold, as you watched, little bits of a picture came together like so many parts of a jigsaw puzzle, and eventually there was a picture there, and then the announcer very pompously said, at this point, perception occurs. Well, that isn't much of an explanation of perception, but I suggest that it will only be when we know a great deal more about physiology that people who prepare programs of that kind will have something better to do and will do a better job. Meanwhile, if we can't turn to physiology for the things that really matter in human behavior, what have we left? Can we turn to some kind of self-observation or introspection? Now, I submit that no one ever introspectively observed a mental process. Suppose, for example, that you hear a bit of music and it reminds you of an old love affair. What have you really observed? Have you observed the association going on between them? Have you seen yourself associate? No, you have simply seen two things. You've, you've seen the music and your own behavior, emotional responses in the autonomic nervous system, perhaps, 
uh, various kinds of verbal behavior, all of the things that happened now in miniature when you had the affair. And though you observe only stimuli and responses, the connection between them can't be observed for reasons I'll make clear in a moment. Suppose you are sitting in the living room waiting for dinner and there's noise going on in the kitchen and suddenly you hear plates being put on the table and silver and so you infer that dinner is about ready and it's time to wash your hands. Now what do you actually see? Do you see a process of inference? No, you, you hear the noises and you observe your own behavior and getting up, washing your hands as you have done in the past when hearing similar noises you have done the same and have arrived at the table with clean hands at the right moment. We, don't, we learn, but we do not see ourselves learning. We discriminate, but we do not see ourselves discriminating. One of the most difficult areas in this way of interpreting what goes on concerns seeing, seeing ourselves seeing something. When someone points to an object and says, do you see that? What do you mean when you say yes? What are you talking about? Do you see yourself seeing? Or are you merely reporting that you are prepared to talk about a given stimulus? I suggest that that is really all that's involved and that you have been taught to say you see something when you are able to talk about it. When someone says, look at the balloon, you look up and you see a balloon. You, do you see yourself seeing it or do you simply see the balloon? When do you stop looking in order to fulfill this demand that you see the balloon. You can do this without orienting receptors. If you're listening to some music and the friend says, listen to the clarinet. And you say, yes, I, I hear that clarinet. What are you, are you hearing yourself hearing? Or are you simply announcing that a clarinet is indeed stimulating you at the moment and that you can talk about it if further questions are, are asked. I suggest that that is really all that is involved and that there is no way in which one can indeed hear oneself, see oneself seeing, or hear oneself um, listening to something. We see only the product. We see stimuli and responses, but not mental processes. And the reason for that is that we have no nerves going to those parts of the brain which are involved in coordinating responses and stimuli, and far more than in a stimulus response pattern, of course. The brain, the main part of the brain, is insensitive. It has, there's no, there are no end organs there, no sense organs there. We have no way of talking about that part of our body. It's the part of our body most out of touch with us, and in, in the sense that it is the part of our body with respect to which we are least likely ever to build descriptive, discriminative, knowing responses. And the reason for that is that we have learned to observe ourselves only when the human species reached the stage of possessing verbal behavior. And until that time came, the only nervous systems which kept us in touch with our body, so to speak, were those which were involved in skilled movements, reactions to stomach aches, and things of that kind. The three nervous systems, intero, proprio, and extero, were concerned with practical behavior, not with self-knowledge and self-awareness and self-management. That came about only when other people could begin to ask you to say, do you see that, or to reply to a question, what are you going to do next, or why did you do that? Just as the physiologist has at the moment nothing adequate to the observation of those micro processes which are involved as the nervous system mediates the relations between the environment and behavior, so we have no access through introspection to those same parts of the brain. I discussed this point in 1945 in a paper called The Operational Definition of Psychological Concepts. And I think that point is beginning to be understood, although relatively slowly, after all, you take 35 years as a, as a measure. But my point there was that when the verbal environment teaches the individual to talk about private events 
and I mean private physical events, events in the body, it lacks certain necessary facts. For example, you can teach a child with color vision to name colors correctly, but you cannot very readily teach him or her to distinguish between embarrassment and diffidence, for example. You can't conjure up these states of the body and say, there, you see, which is that now? Diffidence. No, no, that's embarrassment, and so on, until finally the individual can tell you that he is feeling diffident or embarrassed. I've used pain as an example of this kind of thing. We certainly feel pain in the sense that we react to painful stimuli. But do we know pain in a very different sense when we report that I have a pain? How can that be taught to a child? Well, the environment, the verbal environment, must use external signs. The child shouts quickly and, or cries or jumps, and then the verbal environment, the verbal teacher says, oh, that hurt, didn't it? And that was painful. Yes, you have a pain. But the information available to those who teach is simply the object that caused the pain or the reaction of the child. And if you look at all words describing pains, you see that they refer to the objects that caused them, not to properties of feelings. A sharp pain is the pain caused by a sharp object. A dull pain is the pain caused by a dull object. Excruciating <coughs> refers to the pain of being taken down off a cross, and so on. In this way, we develop a vocabulary for talking about private events. Now, what we see in teaching the child is not what the child feels completely. There are internal private stimuli which begin to pick up and control the use of sharp pain, for example, when it's a, when it's a, a bellyache or something of that kind, or dull pain. But these were first learned where the environment, the verbal environment, had the necessary information about what was, what was going on inside, and, they, and the terms bear the mark of these origins. The logical positivists who <clears throat> tried to dispense with any fact which was not available to two or more people missed this point of how you can indeed actually analyze the description of private events. And, the, and Wittgenstein, who was not exactly a logical positivist, but close, com missed the point completely. As someone said of him recently, Wittgenstein sadly lacked a scheme of self-inspection. Descriptions of pain were really cries of pain. He could not see how terms could be made to refer to private events. Consistently, he argued that adjectives like beautiful or fine applied to a work of art are learned as interjections, which substitute for and su supplement gesture and facial expressions. Behaviorism solves that problem neatly by discovering the extent to which we can talk about private events. We do so badly, of course, and the doctor knows how badly people really describe pains. It's very hard to get an accurate, useful uh, report. The same thing would, uh, applies to other bodily activities, such as the emotions. All terms describing emotions are either metaphors. We say, I feel ebullient, meaning bubbling over, because it somehow or other resembles a teapot boiling over full of bubbles, or the occasions which cause the emotions, just as sharp and dull refer to the occasions for painful reactions. Anger, if you go take the old English dictionary, the Oxford English dictionary, and look up the first uses of words like anger, fear, love, and hate. Were they the names of feelings or emotions? No. They were the names of the things that caused the reactions, which we na then report by using these words. For example, anger first meant some kind of trouble in the environment. The expression, he was bothered by sicknesses and angers. Or angers would be something like sickness outside the individual, but causing a reaction, which then, the private side of which then, picks up the term anger. Fear meant originally a calamity, a danger. In other words, the thing which generates the emotion of fear. Then the term gets shifted 
to the internal stimuli which come about as a result. Love and hate, as you might predict, refer to positive and negative reinforcers quite explicitly in the etymology. To love eventually means to act in ways which are followed by a positive reinforcement, but the word love meant to begin with the thing itself. You say, oh, you're a love, and that means you're the kind of thing that makes me feel loving. Dear or precious are terms used with respect to people we love, but they refer to rarity, and that was the way the word was once used too. We no longer say precious, I think, uh, very often, but it did at one time mean the same thing as it would as a precious jewel. And we still say dear, every letter we write begins with dear. And that was, a, it is a really a recognition of the uniqueness of the, of the rarity of the person being addressed. Now the operant analysis of emotion turns from the private stimuli which are felt when you are emotional to the dispositions to act which are, of course, the things that are involved when uh, these, uh, these things are, are done. The same is true of operant behavior. It goes on inside. The easiest thing to do privately is to talk to yourself. And that's very simply explained. As both a speaker and a listener, you can say things and enjoy hearing them. And that is what goes on when you talk to yourself reminiscing, solving problems, planning action, and so on. It was so clear a case that Watson said that thought is verbal, subvocal speech. But of course, it can be subvocal behaviors of other kinds. It's easy to, to say, I said to myself. It's not easy to say, I rode a bicycle to myself. And yet somehow or other, uh, one can indeed engage in some of the behavior involved in riding a bicycle without the bicycle. The word idea is, uh, is relevant here. The, we say the idea occurred to me to do something or other. Actually, uh, what occurred to you was the behavior. And we say it occurred to me to do something, meaning using the impersonal it as we do in saying it is raining. And we, we, we might go so far as to say the behavior occurred to me. Writing to him occurred to me as I thought of something or other. In other words, the idea is simply the behavior itself and is therefore what you give a person when you give a person an idea. You do something that leads a person to behave in, in a given way. But just as in the case of the emotions, the private events that go along with operant behavior, skeletal behavior, if you will, uh, tend to take over and, and arrogate terms to themselves. I'll take a few examples. To wish. It does seem as if wishing was something that wasn't behavior. It must be kind of mental somehow or other. But wish meant originally to actually to work for, to strive, and it's related to the word win. But after you have striven for something often enough and have used the word wish for that, you use it then for less obvious, less overt behaviors having to do with action leading to a given consequence. To want is, of course, to want, to be wanting. There is an absence of something needed. Need is the, is, tends to be originally aversive control, something you need to do to avoid uh, trouble. Believe is tied up etymologically to a, by, a bound uh, a, a commitment, uh, a being bound to someone or some something. To long for is interesting. What is happening when you're longing for something? Well, the word originally meant precisely you do it a long time. If you are wishing or something of that sort, a, a long time and nothing happens, you are longing for something. And then the word gets moved into some rather subtle private events and you begin to feel that there is a mental process called longing. Yearning for meant originally to express a desire for, to be quite overt about the thing, but you can quietly yearn. Envy meant to try to emulate. Those you envied were those you tried to be like with actual action, with physical action. Sad comes from the word sated, to be satisfied. 
all passion spent, nothing more to be done, and so on. These so-called feelings, these states, which go along with these behaviors are not the causes of the behavior, they're not the expressions of the behavior, they are simply accompanying private stimuli which are related to and have to be explained as the concomitants of operant behavior of various kinds. Now, cognition, of course, means knowledge. And what knowledge is, is another matter. And it is obviously quite relevant to what I am discussing here. Let's, go, let's take a simple example. A hungry rat in a box only occasionally presses the lever protruding from front one wall. If upon one occasion when it presses the lever, it receives food, it tends to press the lever again immediately and many times. Now, what has happened? Well, I've just told you, but that isn't enough to satisfy the cognitive psychologist. According to cognitive psychologists, the rat has learned that pressing the lever brings food. In other words, it knows that, now knows that pressing the lever brings food. The contingencies of lever and food dispenser have somehow or other moved into the rat. Now there isn't a scrap of evidence for anything of that kind. A rat that has learned that pressing a lever brings food is simply a rat which is which presses the lever when hungry, because food then, then has followed. The fact that pressing the lever brings food is the description of the apparatus. It is not anything which has been acquired by the rat. The rat has responded to it. Its behavior has been changed by the apparatus, but the apparatus is no, not inside the rat, is not in any sense entered the rat in the form of knowledge. The word concept is related here. The Suppose you have a, a large number of slides, some of which have fish in them and some of which don't. Herrnstein has done this type of experiment. And when, the, when a pigeon pecks a picture with a fish in it, it receives food, and it pecks any other picture, it receives nothing. Eventually, the pigeon will respond to those slides containing fish and not to the others. It's tempting then to say it has formed the concept of fish. But the person who, fo fo who formed that concept was the experimenter who arranged the apparatus which reinforced pecking to fish and not to others. The concept is in the environment. It's part of the of equipment. It, what has happened to the pigeon is that its behavior is under the control of that class of stimuli which have been created by the, by the psychologist. What is involved here is, the, is a very unfortunate metaphor of storage. The information people have, have played this up to our great disadvantage. We do store information. We, we for example, look into the, in the phone book, we jot down a number, we cross the room, we look at the number and dial it on the phone. We have stored the information on the, the pad. We have not in any other sense stored it in our heads. If we look at the number, walk across, we may store it in the sense of saying it to ourselves again and again on the way over. That's perfectly clear. That's not information. It is actual verbal behavior. And you could call it out to someone else to do the dialing, as you do eventually, really, call it out to yourself as you then dial while talking to yourself or as you dial when looking at the number you have written down. The notion that somehow experience is stored in the brain and called up again, conjured up again when needed, is a very unfortunate misuse, particularly encouraged by the computer, which does indeed do precisely that. But I submit that the human brain or the so-called mind does, does nothing. What has happened is that contingencies of reinforcement change behavior and the behavior is then different. They have not been stored so that they can be conjured up later and, uh, and used again when another occasion arises. A recent issue of the American Psychologist had an article entitled The Permanence of Stored Information in the Brain. And there were some experiments in which people watched a videotape of an accident and then were questioned about it under hypnosis. And they found that 
if the questioner mentioned the license plate, although there was no license plate in the picture, in the sequence, the videotape, many of the subjects would describe the license plate. And this, uh, this then leads to the conclusion that the misleading information had irrevocably replaced the original information in the subject's brain. Now, uh, there you see brain coming in right away again. Uh, actually, all that you have here is what happens when you play a videotape and ask someone to describe it, or when you tell someone something happened and ask him to repeat it. And under hypnosis, the verbal effect is stronger than the, the visual one, and you'll get a description of a license plate. That either one of these was stored somewhere in the brain and conjured up when the subject then responded to questions is the thing that's wrong with that. Two psycholinguists once uh, defined their field as follows. Psycholinguistic studies the processes whereby the intentions of speakers are transformed into signals in the culturally accepted code, and whereby these signals are transformed into the interpretations of the hearer. Well, there's an enormous amount of work to be done in trying to apply that kind of definition. What is the intention of the speaker? How can it be transformed into a signal? How can a signal be transformed into an interpretation and so on? That is very close to nonsense. There's nothing there that really deserves any kind of attention. Actually, you can analyze verbal behavior, as I have done in what seems to me a very much simpler way, without referring to these mental activities and without raising the particularly difficult problem of how you get from a, a mental to a physical event or vice versa. concept of meaning is one of those things which uh, has caused trouble because we tend to put the contingencies into the behavior. If a, an organism does something with a particular consequence, we say it has meaning. You may go down the street to mail a letter. Your walking down the street is said not to be significant until you know the meaning. Well, the meaning is, of course, just the, the consequence. And these efforts to find some, something in the behavior in the form of meaning is, is simply to neglect the contingencies responsible for the behavior. The contingencies are quite clear. You do something on a given occasion because of past consequences. They are where they were in the past. They are not now in the behavior. And some of the cognitive uses of the concept of meaning remind me very much of a practice in Nigeria by certain traditional doctors. This is in the Muslim culture. And to help a patient, they write some phrases from the Koran on a slate. Then they wash the chalk off and with water, collect the water and give it to the patient. Somehow or other, the meanings of these phrases are thus ingested by the patient as, as uh, therapy. And many of the uses of the concept of meaning of assume some kind of entity like a removable content of a word of a similar sort. The the whole field of reason, as distinct from behaving because of causes, raises other issues and is, of course, very much uh, today analyzed by cognitive psychologists in the light of rules, rule-governed behavior, behavior which is done because of specified consequences rather than because of what has happened. When you learn to drive a car, someone sits beside you and you follow rules, instructions, and you drive, of course, very crudely on the parking lot of a drive-in or something like that on a Sunday morning. 
Later on the highway, you drive entirely because of the contingencies of reinforcement, what happens when you turn the wheel, apply the brakes, and so on. You move from driving by following rules to driving as that behavior is shaped by contingencies of reinforcement. That, of course, is a great change, and the contingencies are much more specific, lead to much better behavior than the rules. And this is the difference between knowing something in the sense of knowing the rules and knowing in the sense of having changed behavior because of the contingencies described by the rules. There are two very different kinds of behavior, and in general, the contingencies predominate. Pascal raised the issue. He said that even the most wonderful philosopher standing on a plank, extending out over the, a precipice, would, would be afraid of falling, even though by looking care carefully at the plank, he would see that falling is impossible. In other words, the analysis of the situation which says it is safe to stand here would, far, uh, would, would be lost when compared with the phylogenic visual cliff type of experiment or the ontogenic learning that when you are out over the edge of something, you are likely to, to fall. Now, the real issue to me is not so much the analysis of human behavior as the uses which are made of so-called mentalistic concepts. How often have you heard it said that America lacks a sense of purpose? How often has it been said as if it pointed to a serious fault in Americans? How often have you been told how it is to be corrected? How do you go about instilling a sense of purpose? Now, go back to the rat and the lever. When a hungry rat presses a lever and receives food, it returns to the lever and presses it again and again. Does it do so with the purpose of getting food? Where is the purpose? What are its dimensions? Have we evidence of anything except a change in the rat as a result of which it continues to press the lever? The, the field of operant behavior is the field of purpose. Purpose is an outdated concept which is not in touch with the notion of selection by consequences. You do not need to appeal to purpose in biology, nor do you need to appeal to it in human behavior. The purpose of the hand is not to grasp things. The hand grasps because it has evolved when those who could, because of variations, grasp better were those who survived and passed on this change. If you are going to change American behavior, you aren't going to change purposes, you can attack the problem in, in a, a dozen different ways. What are the things which are reinforcing Americans today? How adequate are these contingencies? We no longer worry about old age in the poorhouse. We have Social Security. We no longer worry about uh, health care. We have Medi Medicare. We no longer work even for the things which are important to our individual survival. In the 19th century, people worked, they were hungry, and they worked for food. Now, at best, you work for a better colored television set. These are the contingencies which are missing, and they are the things that need to be changed rather than the kinds of, uh, of entities which are said to reveal those changes inside the individual. Here is a quotation. Lack of faith in ourselves and in our institutions and the ten tenets upon which our way of life is founded. What is that all about? Why the lack? The phrase is really intended as a description of current behavior. We do not act as successful people act. We do not follow the rules and principles laid down by government, religion, or ethical groups. Our behavior is neither shaped by contingencies or controlled by those who enforce rules. That is what we should say, and that is what actually uh, happens. Here's another one. If the world is to be saved, 
Men must learn to be noble without being cruel, to be filled with faith, yet open to truth, to be inspired by great purposes without hating those who try to thwart them. How vicious one seems, how inhuman, to call that nonsense. Yet nonsense it is. It is nonsense because it refers to nothing that can be done to save the world. What can be done to change the world is to change the contingencies which are involved. This doesn't mean that one does not want a world in which people behave in ways called noble or particular kinds of consequences or in way, not in ways called cruel where the consequences are quite explicit or to act with faith only insofar as they have the facts. That is the distinction between science and uh, superstition and so on. So there is something in that passage but it points to all the wrong things because it points to entities inside the human individual rather than in the world in which the, the individual lives. Now you can go back and find anticipations of the behavioristic point of view. Frederick the Great wrote to D'Alembert. This was at the time of the Enlightenment, which was very close to this position. It seems to me that man is made to act rather than to know. And Fichte, the German philosopher, um, said, we do not act because we know, we know because we are called upon to act, and so on. You can face a lot of these down through. The main thing is not that we reverse this point, but that we now know a great deal more about the contingencies of reinforcement, which do take over and account for behavior in terms of an experience in the environment, the phylogenic experience of the species the ontogenic experience of the individual. And the cogency of this argument will only be understood if you have some familiarity with what is being done. The thing is to turn from what is going on inside to that fascinating and hopeful field of what has happened to the individual outside, what is going on in the environment. And if I have one criticism of cognitive psychology, I think it is that, that it is concerned with things inside and as a result misses all of the terribly important things outside. Now, that doesn't always happen. Uh, I'm not saying that cognitive psychologists have not done important research. Of course they have. It's been very valuable research. My complaint is that they have misrepresented what they've done. They have not known what they were doing. It reminds me a bit of Columbus, who thought he had discovered India. Now, we don't hold it against Columbus, but we would hold it against him if he went on thinking that. And I, and I think it's a mistake to go on calling these people Indians. What he discovered was a fascinating new world in which a great many things have happened as we know and we can forgive the mistake we can say this is not India let's get on with the new world and my feeling about cognitive psychology is that the cognitive psychologists have been looking for India processes in the mind or the brain they have turned up fascinating facts but they really are facts about behavior and that that is the the wonderful world which most needs to be investigated. Thank you very much. I think there's going to be some kind of, of discussion. I would like to mention that if you want to know more about a behavioral parallel uh, to a cognitive analysis, you should hear uh, Robert Epstein at four o'clock this afternoon who will be reporting on what was misprinted as Columbia and simulation, as Columban simulation, pigeon simulation, of higher mental processes. Uh -huh. I need a master of ceremonies. What, uh, this, uh, thank you. Um, do, are they going to come up and use this microphone?
Yes. Well, may I try to repeat? Uh, you, would you not say, after all, your behavior does come from within you? Yeah, that's from within me as an individual? Uh, no, I do not believe that what I've just said was in any sense originated in me. It is the product of 50 years of research, reading, arguments, discussions, annoying colleagues in the department <laughs> at Harvard, and so on. No, I, I don't step outside the causal stream and say human behavior is all a matter of environment except for me. That isn't, tr isn't the case at all. Well, I thought I had, uh, should I repeat that? I think it could be heard, was it? Yeah. Um, that the, the, the statement is that I have ignored the fact that the physical and biological sciences today work on inference and that this would be a very serious loss to psychology if you ruled inference out. I do not take the line of the logical positivist that nothing but observables can be talked about. Uh, the point I made today, uh, the way in which we learn to talk about private events is a very important consideration in evaluating the reports cognitive psychologists make about mental processes. I do not believe that we are at the present time at the stage of inference in human behavior because we do not have the basic relations which move on from a Faraday to a Maxwell but this will come about. I've never been opposed to theory. I believe we must have a, a, an overall theory of human behavior, which would be not only a matter of the assemblage of facts and putting them in good order, but in use of that and in interpreting what goes on in the world at large. I certainly use the same kind of inference when I talk about human behavior in the field that astronomers do when they talk about what is going on out in space. If you take the radiation coming to the Earth today, all kinds and particles and everything bombarding the Earth, what sense can you make of that simply in its own right? Nothing. It is only when you have experimental science on the surface of the Earth that has led to a science of radiation, electromagnetism, and so on, that you can begin to talk about black holes and so on. And that is a kind of interpretation applied to a field where you have no chance of controlling or even predicting by using uh, events analyzed where prediction and control are possible. And I believe that the operant experimental analysis of behavior works just that way. You, you discover some laws of conditioning in the laboratory and, what? Huh? I'm sorry? I didn't Could you repeat that? Yes, I think we can, and we, the whole question is how good the inferences are, and on the basis of how much information. I have no objection whatsoever to the study of the nervous system, and the more we know about it, the closer we will come to its relevance to behavior. But the point I'm making is that the microstructures involved in most of the behavior we are interested in are still far out of reach. Uh, even the single cell work won't work when, you come, when it comes to a cell in the cortex. And 
That is at the moment, I think, entirely out of reach, although for those who wish to speculate, I have, I have no objection. That is not, I think, what the cognitive psychologist is doing. I'm talking about the conceptual nervous system, <coughs> which has been made up from the behavioral facts and then is used to explain the behavioral facts, which is, is a circular kind of, of argument. I, whenever it is possible uh, to build a conceptual s system comparable to physics or chemistry, to some extent biology, I'm sure that it will be done and it will be very important. I just do not think we are at that stage today. We lack, we lack the kinds of basic facts which would be needed for productive inference. Uh, those, let, let those who wish uh, go ahead, but I am objecting to the implication that this is primarily the way cognitive psychologists are working. They, when they study, I didn't quote, but uh, Herbert Simon said that uh, the behaviorists have been reduced to studying rats and so on, but the cognitive psychologists today are doing great things with reaction times and short-term memory. Well, it's a very unfortunate that he chose those examples. The reaction time is entirely a behavioral thing, and short-term memory is too. Uh, if you want to infer something going on in the computer of the mind, all right. But the facts are simply the facts, and they are facts about contingencies of reinforcement, which is why, what I think the field of cognitive psychology is all about. Well, that is a, a question that is always asked about any deterministic position. Uh, if your behavior is entirely determined, is it any more valid than anyone else's behavior which has been entirely determined? The question is, what is it determined by? And as I would not say that I have told you the truth. I have, produced, I have proposed a way of dealing with human behavior which seems to me to work better. That's as far as I would go toward truth. And that is a question of whether or not people who behave in, in one way are more likely to make progress in coming up with a better understanding of human behavior than those who work in another way. And I have, I have enjoyed what I have done. I think it works well. I think it has not been fully understood or realized. And I am, I am and of course, I am defending a position. That was my, my assignment to come, to come here and, and to do that. But you can't get out of it simply by saying that because it is entirely determined, there is no possible progress. You can say that the evolution of the human species has been entirely determined. But does that mean that uh, a person cannot actually do something new? No. The whole, con whole conception of selection by consequences is, is, is a creative principle, but it's not a creative mind. It's not an initiating, originating kind of thing. The important word in Darwin's title was the origin, the origin of species. And he got rid of origination as creation, as I should like to see us get rid of originating behavior as creative behavior as something which starts inside. I want to look at the prior history, phylogenic and ontogenic. Well, that, that's what, I'm, what I'm saying is that the storage was not the environment, that the, the rat that lived in the impoverished environment has not stored an impoverished environment. It has been affected by an impoverished environment. And the person, the rat has pressed a lever and got food, has been affected by that. He hasn't stored the fact that pressing a lever produces food. So it's what is stored, and I don't think the environment gets stored. In fact, that would be a very good example where you shouldn't say there's any storage. Of course, 
the brain has changed and is storing whatever it is, but it started off storing what it was too. <coughs> well, I wish I had a good, a good clear answer to that. Well, the question is, how, how can you account for the extraordinary success of an alternative view over the centuries, which has something to, <laughs> which has, which, which contains the notion of the individual as the achiever, as the actor, as the creator, the originator, and so on. I believe that we are uh, in the same position that Darwin was in. Darwin still has trouble making clear that man is only one of the animals and has pr been produced by the same sequence of events as any other species. And uh, as you know, uh, there are parts of the United States today where you cannot teach Darwinian evolution without mentioning the creative side of things. I think it's exactly the same thing in, in behavior. We do not like to give up the notion that we have been responsible for our achievements. We're only too happy to give up the notion that we're responsible for the bad things we do. We want to be forgiven because we grew up in a bad environment or something like that. But we don't want to be forgiven for creating a beautiful picture by having someone point out the good instruction you had and the good education and the very good paints that were supplied to you and so on. Uh, we, we want credit. This was, was, of course, the main theme of my book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity. In science, by revealing the causes of human behavior, seems to detract from the individual's contribution, and we resist that. And among the things that result from it is we continue to use punishment for a very simple reason. If you punish people for behaving badly, and all that is left is behaving well, they get credit for behaving well. If you create a world in which people inevitably, inevitably behave well, they can't get credit for it. So we go on punishing and we reject systems in which, as T.S. Eliot said, no one will have to be good. You are just good. You get no credit for being good. Obviously, you can't teach a, a someone to drive a car unless he speaks your language, unless he's already learned to follow rules, or, yeah, or unless there are, have, he's been given reasons, in the sense he's been, been reinforced for following rules and punished for not following rules. All this is in the individual, not stored, but as a result, he's been changed. He is the kind of person who has been the, sub, been the product of that history, and that is why you are able to use rules to teach. If you, if you couldn't do that, then you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to, to use rules. They've, there must always be reasons for following rules. Let's take uh, a simpler thing like advice. I think one of the earliest rules would have been advice. You describe something. If you like good French food, go to Le Petit Havre. Now, um, that saves you a lot of trouble wandering around Montreal, finding French restaurants, and finally getting on a good one. It's a description of contingencies. It says two things. Go there, and you'll be reinforced by good French food. I'm not being paid for this. Um, <laughs> I had a very good dinner there last night, that's all. That explains my behavior at, uh, in giving this example. Now, uh, that, no one will follow that unless uh, the person giving the advice has in the past given advice, which when followed has led to happy consequences and when not followed, nothing. Or it won't, won't be followed, of course, if advice has led to, to bad uh, food and other things in the past. So, so the fact that the individual giving the advice 
is followed, it depends upon what has happened in the past with respect to that individual or to others like him. But still, you're not happy. Go ahead. he was a policeman? Yes, uh, well, obviously, you tend to follow the uh, recommendations of policemen. I see. Well, no, I, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. In general, in a place like this, you do respond to the advice of people in uniform. And uh, that's why they have uniforms. <laughs> I don't know a great deal about cognitive uh, therapy, uh, but I, w I believe that the main objection which seems to be urged against non-cognitive therapy is based on a misunderstanding. I never suggest shaping the behavior of someone. It's a laborious process. If you can model the behavior or tell the person what to do. And we build very early in children the behavior of imitating a model, and we build it very early, the behavior of responding to instructions, rules, advice, and so on. And it would be perfectly absurd to suppose that you have to take a patient or a client and begin to work on contingencies without ever suggesting any behavior. Uh, in, in my book, The Technology of Teaching, I discussed the priming of behavior and you, you have to get the behavior out in order that it can be reinforced. And you do it by either by modeling or by, by giving rules, instruction, direction, and that kind of thing. Now, I don't know what goes on in, in many other fields of cognitive therapy, but I take it the rational kind of thing, or you give reasons rather than causes, is simply the case in which you use rules rather than contingencies. I would suppose that contingencies of reinforcement are, crudely speaking, the causes of behavior. Rules are the reasons for behaving, but they are nothing more than the descriptions of the contingencies which are the causes. But it's an enormous saving for a culture to teach the individual to take advantage of what others have learned by imitating and by following advice, warnings, maxims, rules, laws, the laws of government, the laws of science, the same thing. Mr. Skinner, I believe I understand your argument is not the state of the art of psychology that we don't yet have the techniques to explain behavior in terms of physiological variables, but do you really think something like intelligence uh, would be susceptible to that type of a reductionist argument that one day in the future we will be able to explain now the question is whether or not in the future we could explain intelligence in terms of physiological variables. I don't want to explain a thing called intelligence. I do distinguish between kinds of behavior you call intelligence and behavior you, you don't. It usually refers to whether, it's, uh, whether it meets the current contingencies of reinforcement. It is a genetic feature of, of the individual and of the species. And I don't for a moment doubt that human beings are very different from other primates and that among human beings some are different from others. And uh, these are facts that have to be faced by the educator, by the therapist, by, by those who arrange incentive systems in industry, by those who govern, those who deal with prisoners, 
institutionalized people, these are all different, and you can't have a cookbook rule for, for everyone, and the, the dimension you call intelligence would be one of those. Some will learn quickly, retain a great deal without getting it all mixed up, and so on. I would like to see intelligence as now measured, uh, supplanted by what are essentially slope constants in behavioral processes, uh, which uh, have to do with how fast things are learned, what kinds of things are learned, how long they stay around, how easily they get mixed up, and, and so on. Well, I don't see it. I don't know what the cognitive interpretation of intelligence is. But to be quite frank with you, I've been talking about cognitive psychology without knowing much about it. But I, uh, I don't read the literature. Yes. the facts. I'm, I, I don't deny the facts that you have just described, but I don't think we need the word goal uh, to, to take them into account. A goal is one of those things in the future, like a purpose or an aim, which are not really necessary. The behavior, goal-directed behavior, is simply behavior which has had consequences in the past under circumstances similar to these. Now, the fact that there is an element of imitation and something else in this uh, episode uh, is, is the kind of thing which needs further explanation, but you don't add anything to it by saying there was an understanding of the goal to be achieved that led to this behavior. I would want to work, observe those things more closely. Well, you don't act because of the current consequence in any case. You act because of similar consequences in the past under, under similar circumstances. And that doesn't press the lever to get food. It presses it because it has got food. And your uh, chimp does that for reasons which I can't analyze in the spur of the moment, but I would look for a very long history of manipulating those, those objects plus your imitative modeling and so on. Uh, I, I can't here give you an alternative explanation, but I am suggesting that you haven't helped. In fact, I think you have delayed getting on with this by saying all we do need to do is to assume that it understands the goal to be achieved. I think when you say that, you stop looking, and you won't find the real... What? No. But the, the, the tendency, the tendency when you give a cognitive explanation, the tendency is to suppress further action. It, you say, so why, why did you come here today? Well, I felt like coming, so I don't ask you anything further. But I should say, why did you feel like coming, you see? And uh, the general tendency of references to mental states is to bring inquiry to a dead stop. And that is the main damage done, I think, by it. Yes? <laughs> I'm sure it's not. But I'm sure that you will recognize that with with any 
approach to behave, whether it be your approach or Paul's approach, mm -hmm. Bruce Watson's mm -hmm. approach. It's possible to account for anything and everything that we hear reported. Uh, and so that, that's no strength of, of a perspective, uh, I believe. Uh, if I may quote Carlo, years back, he said, one of the problems is that mm. the approaches are so rubber bands, they can now account for everything. The problem no. is that they don't really actively differentially predict. Now, given that we still don't have the state of perspective development to the point where we can differentially predict <coughs> with great definition or embarrassment of perspectives, and that's what I think we yep. would all like to have, I think it's important that we take a view of the idea generating uh, value of perspective. I'm referring to the heuristic value of perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, from um, what is your perspective with regard to the relative heuristic value of the heuristic perspective as opposed to not the kind of simplistic cognitive perspective as well he did it because mm -hmm. he felt like that or what have you. Yeah. But to try to uh, get the richness of behavior still tied in with the antecedent. And we do mm -hmm. endorse the notion of antecedent mm -hmm. looking at the history. But we do believe that there is something more <coughs> to behavior than that just which the environment mm -hmm. and the contingency mm -hmm. has brought to the present time. Mm -hmm. Rather, the organism has some kind of synthesis, some kind of generating properties to produce, to create. And I don't think you would quarrel with that. With no, uh, I, I, I could, I'm tempted to answer you by describing some of the things that uh, Robert Epstein is going to talk about at 4 o'clock this afternoon, but I can't do that. But I do believe that it is possible to simulate uh, this kind of thing in very simple organisms. I assume a pigeon is very much simpler than a chimpanzee. And by a a new kind of use of contingencies of reinforcement. No, very few people, I would say, I, somebody once said only a dozen people can understand Einstein. I'm not trying to run in that class, but I, I would say that there aren't more than a dozen people in the world today that could do some of the experiments that are, he will describe this afternoon. It's just you have to know too much about shaping behavior through programmed contingencies. And I, uh, if anyone wants to challenge, if, you, if one of those 12 is here, I would be very happy to accept that, or maybe more than one. But if you, if you question that, I would, uh, I would say, okay, now don't ask anybody's advice, but go ahead, let's see you do it. Some of the things that uh, you'll see pigeons doing this afternoon. And I, that is terribly important, that um, once you understand the full power of contingencies, then you feel less need to refer to these inner creative uh, and so on. You take the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I need the microphone. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, as you know, Epstein and I tend to put a touch of satire in our publications, and <laughs> and uh, we use the word simulation simply for fun, thinking of computer simulation. 
you can program a computer to simulate natural selection or operant conditioning, a lot of things, you see. And we are simulating cognitive processes. Uh, we don't say necessarily this is what is happening uh, with a human subject or even the other primates, but it is what can happen when uh, we arrange the proper contingencies at, at a somewhat lower level. And a very important element in the research we're doing is that although we do intervene up to a point, we then turn the thing over to the pigeon, and from that point on, is entirely up to the pigeon. So you can say that we're leaving it to the creative, cognitive activities of this little brain, which is as big as my little fingernail. But uh, I wouldn't put it that way myself. <laughs> way back. All right. <laughs> Uh, contingencies of reinforcement. I, o I only need to be reinforced, to be understood about once a year to keep me going. <laughs>
raising the human species beyond what it could otherwise be as merely a member of all the species on the surface of the earth. I'm sure I've convinced you all. regard myself as a reductionist at all. I'm not reducing mind to behavior. I'm simply pointing out that mind is never necessary to explain the behavior, and what now, what we have now is what has always been the case. I think this is true of, uh, well, I'm going to give you my lecture tomorrow now, but life and mind are essences which have been used to explain things until we have an alternative explanation. And when that first molecule came together to, to reproduce itself, it was alive. That's what you mean by life. Uh, it made possible selection by consequences. And you didn't have to have something called life added to it. And when uh, human behavior reached the point that we could behave in certain very complex ways, that was human behavior without the addition of something called mind, or non-physical consciousness or awareness. I'm not reducing consciousness to anything. I'm disposing of it as an unnecessary essence. I'm getting back to what has, has always been the case when people have been aware of the environment, aware of themselves, and so on. And that's it. Of a non 
phylogenetic response. But um, that is our leader, our experimental question, and it should be approached in that way. Uh, if the, the operant imitation comes about because if one organism is doing something, another organism, by doing it, will be exposed to the same contingency. If, some, if you walk outside now and everybody's looking up, it's a good time to look up. Looking, looking up has some interesting consequences. And, and the child learns to imitate behavior because very often there are reinforcing consequences, not every time, of course. But I think really you will find that, that this kind of thing is learned. And this is the kind of thing, I'm going to point this out again more if I have any lecture left, um, that um, imitation, both of biologists make this mistake. Because there is polygenic imitation and oncogenic, they assume there's something called a structural principle of imitation that somehow they're tied in together. I don't think that's the case. I don't want to get on to that because I'll have a lecture on that tomorrow. I'm sorry? Well, I don't know the literature we're talking about, and I don't know what the Hagerism did about it, really, but uh, I would say that if you get evidence of imitation, which is not polygenic, it probably has some polygenic element in it, if one rat runs around, the rat's going to run around, and that, that would be, that would have survival value for the species and would be built into the rat, as far as I know. Now, I don't know how far that goes in manipulating the environment and so on. How much, it's very hard to know how much of it is genetic and how much of it you can learn. You have to be very careful about raising uh, a rat in isolation and so on to, to check that. It may have been done, I don't know. I'm, I'm very, I'm not well read in psychology. That's how I've been that's why I've been able to do so much. Mm 
But of course there is something inside the responsibility, especially the newborn infant that they obviously behave in certain ways. And if all things you felt to go to the species, that's the way they do behave, because it's meant they would survive, and that behavior has been transmitted as part of the genetic endowment of the newborn infant. And for a while behaviorists uh, were assumed to be denying this kind of thing. I remember uh, Leonard Carmichael was uh, very much interested in uh, genetic behavior, and when he became secretary of the Smithsonian, he gave instructions for the National Zoo, which was under the Smithsonian control, to alert him whenever there was going to be the birth of, uh, of a new uh, offspring in any, any species. And he would, in the middle of the night, he'd dash out and watch the behavior of the newborn. And he found some fascinating things. For example, he saw a giraffe born, and a giraffe gets up on all fours, it's the offspring, the young giraffe, he struggles around a bit, and then he goes over, and it's kind of like I put it to me, do we see the young giraffe struggling and exploring around to find the teeth of the mother? No, because I for it. Well, there must have been some very specific inborn behavior in a young giraffe. He gets it up on his feet, and of course, gets it to stay with the, the mother, the colt that runs right alongside the mare. These are things that are just part of being a colt. And uh, being a young baby is the kind of thing young babies do. And what is inside, of course, is the baby. Uh, and uh, that is, it's a result of an uh, evolutionary process. And I'm not in any sense questioning the relevance of the anatomy and physiology of, of the species. Well, all right. You know. I'll say if you want to say, but uh, uh. Yeah, Well, you, you put it very well, it's exactly what I am saying, that the environment does not get into the animal somehow or other. Uh, some of it is in there pyrogenically, of course. But except for that, I don't believe that the looking down when something falls and so on, uh, I doubt very much that that's genetic. It could possibly be a visual trip or a human experiment, but... Uh, uh, and I think you know, the, the young babies who found it, found over here the baby may look to turn that way and so on. There's a lot of that stuff there, but it, it can't be brought under the means and kind of thing. That means and is it, phylogenic, it can't do anything with, with evolution. I'm talking about the means and in the, in the individual experience, and that is, I think, a matter of contingency, and I see no reason to push them inside the individual and say that they now are, are understood as concepts or facts or any kind of effort. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, this is a, this is a problem, and this uh, you get 
drag up the very little bits that there is around. Karen, um, um, I guess Karen Tony mixed up. Um, um, I'll get it in a moment. Anyway, she was the person who worked with, with dolphins at Sea Life at the, uh, in, in, uh, in Hawaii. And she now knew that city and was working with animals and views and that kind of thing, setting fire. Um, she worked with, they used to demonstrate often conditioning to create audiences, and they'd be chased up near the pages. And so they kept looking for the pages first. And they, uh, and the course would go through all the old ones, but they didn't want that, they wanted the new ones. And the dolphins would completely exhaust all of dolphin behavior. And one of the most interesting things was that a given type of dolphin would begin to do things that had never seen the last time before. They would be in the dolphin repertoire, but ordinarily in some other thing. So it's the the always scrounging around for anything that could get, that could be new. And uh, this was a kind of, I think, all the time of search for something new, creativity, the way it was, reinforcing every physical little bit of behavior. And um, it looked like the cognitive search, the better I've got to be on, but um, it doesn't, uh, it can be analyzed in another, in another way. Well, but you get, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but the only part you have to be able to spot a consequence for something for any given act. That is the product of some sense of the other act, and you come together, and that is the whole point of this positive simulation. I think you'd be interested in the up down to uh, the this afternoon. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to publicly will, but it's a bit of a small step on self image and those sort of things. Here it is, here it is, here it is a real, uh, it looks like a pretty novel response for the first time on the part of the pigeon, and yet it is traceable to forces to carry up the cause. Okay, that, that's what happened with program instruction. People started writing very bad programs, but they were better than no programs, and so the whole thing uh, got uh, misrepresented. No. No. Uh, I think we should uh, call a Thank you. Thanks very much. This program is now concluded. Thank you.